ploughing, the oldest job in farming, the basis of all agriculture. The skills learnt by each new generation for thousands of years passed on from teacher to pupil. Dr. Alan Rees is one such teacher, instructing his students at Newcastle University. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? But now he's applying this knowledge to an entirely new field, oil fields under the North Sea, where the ploughs help bury pipelines and telephone cables. They're tested first at sites scattered over the north of England, on the beach at Cresswell in Northumberland, in the Solway Firth, in Maryport Harbour, and in a clay pit at Bertley, County Durham. In fact, wherever the soil conditions mimic the seabed. Well, and I must say, from where I stood, you look like the mad inventor. In <laughs> Do you really have to go in in these conditions? Well, it can be a lot rougher than this. The wind is at least off the beach. Yes. It's hard to do anything very sensible in such conditions. But it's essential that you do it. Well, sometimes we're in a hurry, get some results. The trouble is it costs a lot of money to come here, bring a lot of instrumentation, a lot of people and so on. So we often... So you can't quite... waste any time? No, we're often uh, yeah. doing some quite enjoyable stuff in some rough water. It's a good lark as well, of course. Yeah, I think you're ready to get that off now, though, aren't you? Well, I've got a small leak in my right leg. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I'm very comfortable. Yeah. The testing looks haphazard, but it's a vital part of the design process. And it's his ability as a designer that's helped Alan Rees to exploit his academic knowledge in a thriving and profitable business. We started as experts in soil mechanics and people asked us, you know, how hard will it be pull, to pull a plough here? Ha what will happen in clay of this type? And we started giving them advice and then, then they, they said, well, you know, we didn't like the look of the ploughs they were designing, right? I mean, I was a plough designer for International Harvester once. You know, we started suggesting a few things about the ploughs and now we finally ended up actually building the ploughs, which is much more enjoyable. Yeah, much more profitable. The business started big. The first plough weighed 50 tonnes. It was over 40 feet long and 20 wide and took four of the world's biggest crawlers to pull it through the test bed clay pit. But it worked. In BP's Statfjord field, it gouged a neat channel over a mile long, 500 feet down, pulled by a massive tug on the end of a half mile tow rope. The seabeds of the world are becoming increasingly covered with a network of pipes and cables and a simple straightforward thing we're doing is we're burying the pipes and cables to protect them from damage. The damage comes from either anchors or trawls. The continental fishermen they use a big heavy beam trawl and that really batters a, a thin cable or a small pipe. Is there a great distinction between whether you are laying cable or pipe? Well Oh, obviously, the, the pipes vary in size and uh, up to what up, size? Well, up to up to 40 inches in diameter. They're monstrous things. Now, you're not trying to protect a huge pipe against a small trawl board, right? That's not the problem. There are other reasons for burying pipes apart from the protection from damage. You want to keep a lot of them warm. The oil comes up out of the ground, very hot, and then it flows along the pipe to a platform, say and it gets cooled by the sea and all sorts of things deposit out of it, so you want to keep it warm. Well, a very good way of keeping it warm is to put it in a trench and put the soil back over it. It makes the mind boggle. I mean, it's all feasible, is it? You've actually done it, have you? Well, yes. Uh, we're trying to do it cheaper and cheaper and in more and more difficult circumstances, so that every job we've done always has some new element in it. You said that you did have experience in designing agricultural ploughs, but this is getting quite a long way from Department of Ag Engineering in a way, isn't it? Actually, this is really agricultural engineering, but transposed into a different environment. Really, our success, I think, comes out of the fact that we are agricultural engineers. You know, we make these things elegant, lightweight, easy to pull. We're competing with people who are usually designing reinforced concrete bridges and, and it's not surprising that their ploughs are big and heavy and ugly. The business is run from the dining room of his house in Wylam, 10 miles up the Tyne from Newcastle. Black, back using Three drawing boards, a few books and a small computer are all the capital investment needed to support the whole design business. It's based on one or two very large orders. 
you know, we've been mainly busy for the last few years working for British Petroleum. We've done about something over £400,000 worth of work for them. And then another big project coming along is with uh, British Telecom. We've probably done £150,000 worth of work with them. And now the, uh, the whole thing is really gathering pace. And British Telecom project is going along nicely. And we're beginning now to work for Brown and Root in, in, a, in a really big way. And Brown and Root are? Well, they're simply the biggest contractors in the world. Uh, so so that, that makes it rather simple in that we're, we're not chasing a large number of little jobs. No, this is one point two. The company, Soil Machine Dynamics, is essentially a team of four people. Tim Grinstead shares the main design work with Alan. Tony Trapp does the hydraulics and instrumentation. And Alan's son, Simon, finds his philosophy degree no barrier to keeping the whole thing going as a business. I'd work for Harvester and Ford, right? And I thought that to be a real engineer and make real machines, you had to have the backing of a big company. I didn't think that as a university lecturer, I could actually build vast machines. Well, <laughs> that, that I, what I've found is that's completely untrue. Just out of my dining room, I've been able to construct monstrous machines in far quicker time than International Harvester could do. I mean, they, we built the tractor you saw on the beach. Mm. We, d we started from scratch, designed and built that tractor and plough, all 25, 30 tonnes of it, in three months. You know, we spent about £150,000 on it. And that literally came out of this dining room yeah. and that small group of chaps. The Wylam dining room may be the design centre, but construction is contracted out. Pearson's built BP's Magnus tractor, and now they have to modify a British Telecom grapnel for recovering buried cables. What are you doing? Is this, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, you, you said it could come this with a hammer. I've tried it with a hammer. No way, that'll move with a, a mill. I'll put it on the 50 ton steeple press. It still wouldn't move. And who will you turn around and stick it on there and move? I'll drill it out. Well, that's the only way I've been able to do it. If you have a look. They've been working with Alan Rees for years, mainly on military projects like anchors for recovery vehicles and mine ploughs. Well, one of the biggest parts of it was some chaps who came and said, uh, you know about lifting sugar beet and turnips, and um, I said, yeah, sure I do. And they said, well, do you think you could lift anti-tank mines from in front of a tank? I said, yeah, that sounds like the sort of thing we could do. That was a, is a, was a major piece of engineering of which our part was a fairly small part but it was the bit to do with the teeth that lifted the mines without getting clogged up with grass you know that sort of thing which we knew about. For all the distraction of building up a business Alan Rees retains his commitments to the university. I think you should look after these guys I mean he hasn't come all the way from China just to learn about saw mechanics right I mean he, the uh, Liang I think they come here to learn what dancing and boozing and fornication, all the other things that these chaps specialise in. So I, I think you should uh, look after them. But could he still muster enthusiasm for the nine o'clock lecture? Right. Uh, I, I left you with uh, a question. I've come to the conclusion that teaching must be rather built into me. You know, if I see someone putting sugar in their coffee, I set to to persuade them that it's much nicer without it, you know? If the girl who cuts my hair has come back from lying on a beach at Benidorm, I, I find myself persuading her to go skiing next year. And uh, my business is based entirely on the two main courses I give, you know, soil mechanics and agricultural engineering too. And I don't know why, but uh, the, the more successful the business, the more enjoyable I find it trying to get the basic ideas into the students. And, and a, an important idea is that shear stresses come out of the difference between the normal stresses. The same enthusiasm shows through out in the field on a gloomy October afternoon. We want the thing as perfect as possible as soon as you can get. Well, anyway, make the adjustment. That, that's right, when you rotate that, what it does, it angles the plough that way or that way, but the plough will only work, run straight, that's okay? Right. So if you angle it that way, then, then, it'll, it, yeah, then it'll move across until it's straight. Okay, so but there's more to the lesson than just a practical demonstration of an engineering system. 
these are clever lads, right? And first of all, it's a challenge to do a nice job of ploughing. There's no doubt about that. But we hope that they are, you know, they ask me, how do I increase the depth? And I say, right, well, you push that lever down. And then I say to them, well, what do you think that does? Well, what that does is very subtle, right? That goes into your hydraulic servo mechanism. And we expect them to go and read about that and to start thinking about what is in a draft control system. And in this way, this is really valuable engineering education. Ah, looks good. It's actually working then. It is, yes. Um, we're hoping to get a run of a couple of metres. We're going to measure the uh, draft force, horizontal force. We're not going to bother with the vertical one. But it uh, should be working OK. And it'll go a couple of metres without failing. With a bit of luck, yes. <laughs> right, let's have a look at it then. When he drew up the degree course 20 years ago, Alan Rees made design a key element. Working in small groups, the students spend 18 months tackling a real engineering problem. This group is working in the soil mechanics lab, developed for successive research projects and recently the government's marine technology programme. But does it help when it comes to getting a job? Well, I think you see that this particular group have been rather lucky. They, they've had a very nice project. You know, it's got all sorts of problems. The original design problems right now that they have quite a complicated piece of a gadgetry that works in the soil. They've got hydraulic drives. They've got instrumentation. So I don't think there's any doubt that these students have benefited very much from this particular project. Well, um, they'll and be they... pleased to hear that because they seemed a little bit uncertain. <laughs> Well, you have to get fairly old before you can become cocky and confident and know what you're doing is valuable. <laughs> Success generates opposition, and not everyone in the university is sympathetic. But Alan Rees is keen to defend his position. If you're teaching engineering, it's very helpful to be an engineer. It isn't science, and it isn't to do with thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and so on, except incidentally. It's a creative, adventurous, exciting thing. Almost all the creative and exciting part of it is left out by the average university course and always in the Department of Agricultural Engineering we've tried to get that part into it and what I see is that you will only get it into it in a convincing way if the teachers in the university are actually part themselves of thriving businesses. In his crusade to transform university thinking Alan Rees claims only limited success. Few seem likely to continue to challenge existing conventions when he leaves in a few months' time. Till then, relief from the numbing tedium of academic bureaucracy with another test session in the sea. Well, why do you have to gear up like this, then, for working <laughs> well, on the beach? Well, obviously, if, if we're just, you know, loading pipe in and that type of thing, then we can do it in the dry. But... Uh, anything to do with the forces in the soil you actually have to be under the water because with sand if you try and plow at any speed underwater you get fantastically high forces much much higher than you do in the dry in clay on the contrary you get lower forces because it lubricates it makes it beautifully slippery so if you want a realistic test of the way the thing's going to perform under the sea then you've actually got to get into some water as long as you've got a metre or so that completely covers the furrow, then that's enough. But that's enough to make you very wet and very cold. Yeah. And somehow or other, we always do this in the winter. Why do you personally ever go into the water? Oh, well, we don't use labourers and people, you know, and fitters and so on. We do all the testing ourselves because this is a mystery because it takes place in deep water. The guys who use this equipment really know nothing about it. They launch it into deep water they have a vague impression from poor video and sonar of what's going on, right? All the real experience of how the soil flows, how the plough goes over rocks and all that, that's all gained by this sort of testing. So we do all the testing ourselves, we get there in the water with it, we feel it, we listen to it, we try and watch it as far as we can. And that's really crucial experience. Right, now the... Crucial. The, these are how very... How much does one of those things cost? Well, it's, a, it's about 150 quid's worth of suit. And uh, it's a new development. You know, we used to work in wetsuits, and they were very unsuitable for our purposes. But they're OK once you get under the water, but if you're just working in waves, every time a wave goes over you, a fresh lot of cold water goes th through your suit. And boy, that really makes you shout. 
The beaches of Northumberland are ideal test grounds for sandy seabeds and they also offer rocky outcrops. Surveys of the projected route may show no alternative and with a strong enough tow, this plough for British Telecom would cut a groove through sandstone enough to protect the delicate fibre optic cable. The normal technique is simply to lay the cable on the seabed without not, any not protection. Buried at all. That's right. The, on, the only thing that's new is that we are now laying it and burying it with a plough. Now that isn't new either. There's been one fairly successful plough in the world for 10 years or so. That belongs to AT&T. That's a 25 tonne monster that really puts tension into the cable that it's laying. This, this is only weighs three tonnes and it can put cable down into the ground very gently indeed, at very low tensions. Yeah. The only alternative technique for burying pipes uses massive jets of water to force the seabed away. It's slow, crude and expensive, so the precision of ploughing offers huge cost savings to Allen's customers. But does he charge them enough to really benefit from those savings? I think one of the big problems of, an, of academics coming into business is that you don't charge enough, no. You know, people have, pretty well everybody we've worked for at the end of the job have said, well, you know, that was pretty good, quietly. If you charged half a million instead of 400,000, we would have been perfectly content. Is that because you yourself are an optimist and uh, yes, go yes, at a fair pace? <laughs> yes, I, I always think that the job can be done quicker and cheaper than actually turns out. And so part of the reason for charging too little money is that you told them it would cost too, you know, your estimate was too little in the beginning. But of course that's, that's where experience comes in and I think we're getting much more realistic. They need to be. The latest job carries a penalty clause of £100,000 if they miss the 1st of June deadline for delivery. So the risks involved with novel design are high. The really nice thing about business is that it's mutually satisfactory. You know, I want to buy a quarter of a million pounds worth of control. That guy wants to sell a quarter of a million pounds worth of control. Both of us end up highly satisfied. And not surprisingly, on that basis, we found that, that you can have very enjoyable relationships. Now, the art, of course, is to find the people you can trust. And there are a lot of people, there's a lot of industry in this country which is pretty moribund. And, uh, well, one thing we've got good at is putting a proposition to people and uh, fairly hurriedly saying, well, look, it's uh, lunchtime and we buzz off and <laughs> go somewhere. Yeah. So far, the company has avoided the entanglements of lawyers, relying instead on trust and a telex. But big companies placing huge contracts have to be cautious. All about industrial relations here. Yes. Now that, now, that is a really interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah. Every trade unionist in England ought to read that page. I mean, that, that just simply says, we want a clear picture of your relationship with your, with your trade unions. I mean, that, that would totally eliminate British shipbuilder well, look, look, from look, any look, part in this. Well, now, what about the, the number and duration of work interruptions during last the last idea. three, three yeah. years? Oh, yeah, they always ask for that in those things, the mobile one, did as well. Yeah giving the causes of the exact number of lost manors. Ski holidays, I mean. <laughs> 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 I mean That's that. right. <laughs> That's right. That's what they should have, isn't it? <laughs> hey, I really enjoyed that. Most of Alan's warm. contracts have a skiing or climbing holiday built in. So there is a break yeah. from work. But the odd day on a Northumbrian crag is no longer so common. <laughs> oh, don't fall right off the very top. That was fantastic. There's something about this which is absolutely marvellous. You know, the combination of a little bit of exercise in a really beautiful place. And today, of course, is absolutely peerless. You know, there's, the lake is completely still. The frost, wherever there's a shadow. The rock, actually, is, is warm to touch, beautiful to look at. But this, this place, what I like about this place is that you look out there and there's that horizon two or three miles away and you think, well, what's over there? What's over there? Many times we've come here to climb and we thought, now what is over there? Actually over there all there is is exactly the same as what you can see from here. And you think, bloody, what's over there then? And before long you, 
You're a long way from your car. <laughs> Stop telling me all the things I was telling you 20 years ago. Any recreation is a challenge to be experienced to the full. But now, a natural leader, but second on the rope, he recognises others also have a role to play being led. Yes, into an extraordinary degree. Tricky little bit there. Good hand hold on a bit of grass. Particularly amongst the working people on Tyneside. They're superbly schooled, intelligent, nice people, but they have a, a reluctance to stand up for themselves and do what they think is right. My attitude, if anybody tries to deflect me from my path, I pursue that path <laughs> more vigorously. But we come across so many people, especially on Tyneside, who really are rather timid and supine almost. <laughs> I've always made it hard work, yeah. I'm always in too much of a hurry. As I get older, I begin to appreciate people more, you know. And there's all different types of people. And uh, almost all of them are, well, I have learned there are one or two really nasty people, but on the whole, they're all, almost all of them are enjoyable, skillful in lots of ways, you know, and have different things they want to do. I've got one very small hold here. Lovely hole, only got my fingers in there, it won't come out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a small moment of fright as I started to break off backwards. Has it changed your outlook, though, as an academic now involved in business? Oh, yes. I was a really typical academic. I was very happy to be poor, you know, as long as I got a decent pair of boots and a climbing rope and a couple of rucksacks. I was, that's, and some skis, what else did I need? Well, to be in business, you, you've got to make money, and you've got to be a bit interested in money. Well, and it's pretty enjoyable stuff to have. Yeah. You know, we're looking forward to all having BMWs and uh, <laughs> all living in splendid houses. Yeah, but that brings up another aspect, that you're using university facilities and university money to fuel your own business success. How does that go down? Now, look, look. The, the problem in this country is to develop manufacturing industry, any type of industry, to create employment, to create wealth. In order to do that, the government is busily spending money. You, you hear frightful tales like £50,000 spent per job on probably a job, say, in DeLorean's works, which lasted a couple of years, right? The, the universities are... The government is pleading with the universities to take money and convert it into jobs, right? The old idea that the sort of thing I'm doing is stealing the nation's resources is, is absolutely, totally wrong. If you, that, there's no doubt, ask, ask Mrs Thatcher, anybody in, in government, of any party, what they want is to take government money, put it through the universities and get something out, right? What, what you're getting out of us, if you take, say, the Magnus Project, we did £400,000 worth of work. BP saved on that, on that particular part of the job something like £5 million. That is a huge gain in national wealth, which has come out of our little seed bit. That's, that's what people expect from the universities. Do you know, um, before I met you, somebody tried to describe you to me, and uh, they said you were a man who hurtled everywhere. Is that a... Does that fit your own? Do you see yourself <laughs> as a man who hurtles everywhere? Well, I, I do notice, I say to students, come up to my office, and when I get there, I look round, and they're not there. And yeah, five minutes yeah. later, they but, arrive. But also, I gather that you ought not to hurtle everywhere because you have got a slight heart condition that should make you go a little slower. Yeah, I had a rheumatic fever when I was a kid and did something horrible to one of the valves yeah. and they wouldn't let me play football so I said can I swim and they said oh yeah okay yeah, you can swim if you like and I ended up playing water polo <laughs> and I think that you know got it yeah. all working rather well so it doesn't bother me. 
But you, you always, you seem so confident all the time that you can avoid the, the penalties of of uh, building up a big business and and uh, and not lose the pleasure of your outside activities. What makes you so sure you can do that? Well. Uh, just now, the pressure is beginning to be slightly too intense, but so, but so far we we thoroughly en enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I, I've worked to the point of being actually physically ill quite often. On the other hand, I've climbed mountains to the point of being physically ill. I've recently, every time I've gone skiing, I've injured myself. Um, you know, that's life, isn't it? Well, it's the, na the nature of the beast, is it? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, if you talk about skiing, for example. We, the company skis, right? We have a, a company skiing holidays, you see. And until recently, we were convinced of our total indestructible nature. Well, uh, one by one, we've all become partially destroyed. Mortality broke through again just 10 days later with a ruptured stomach ulcer that put him in hospital for a week. But it did nothing to dampen his enthusiasm for the future. We're slightly fed up with handing over our gear to people who take it to see and use it. We want to go to see and use it ourselves. I mean, it's a lark, you know? These young guys, they want to go to the far corners of the earth doing exciting work, right? And, and they don't spend all of their life either on these drawing boards or down in Pearson's factory or up at Crespel on the beach. Like they want to get off to Java and the Gulf of Mexico and so on. So we, we want to construct that sort of business. And uh, we don't intend to run the business in a way that isn't enjoyable. I'm certainly not going to have anything to do with employing people who are not skiers, mountaineers, who like going under the water, right? Uh, and, and I'm going to keep it a small group of really good, clever, enthusiastic engineers. And, and it will make a lot of money like that. But will the pursuit of money crowd out the other pleasures of life? Alan Rees is confident it won't. <laughs> well, I, I, I long ago started enjoying it, right? And I think all the time I've been at the university, the main thing I've been doing is trying to teach students that it's enjoyable. And, I mean, if you're a teacher of engineering, I, I'm trying to teach them engineering's enjoyable, but I've also tried to introduce them, you know, to Northumberland, to a bit of climbing, a bit of running down hills and so on. I think that's the main thing. No, I mean, there is, you know, I suppose, under, underneath it all, there must be some slight sense of what's right and wrong. On top of that, though, if you can't do it and enjoy it and laugh, then don't do it at all.